Thank you, our Father. Thank you, our Father. Spirits that are set against the church. A lot of these spirits we're not aware of. We feel them. We feel their influence. We feel their power. We know they're there. We can't see them. And we really don't know what type of spirit it is, what type of snake it is. Some of the churches I pastored, I, I had problems that uh, I knew I had a problem, but I didn't know where the problem was coming from. I could not see the problem. I could not see the, I knew some of the people that were having problems and channeling those problems toward me, but I really didn't know exactly where the problem was, uh, was coming from. <coughs> this, in this particular occasion here, the setting for this scripture, Paul is on what will be his last journey, and he, he encounters a, a horrific storm. This is the last missionary journey that perhaps he will go on. When the ship is destroyed, some swim to shore while others float on broken pieces of the ship. They were shown great kindness by the local people in that a fire was built to remove the chill and to dry them from the rain. It was pouring down rain and it was cold. And uh, the barbarous people built a fire to warm them, to dry their clothes, and, and they really showed kindness and took care of them. Paul was not content with the temperature of the fire. And I want to tell you something. If you ever get content, if the church ever gets contented with the temperature of the fire, we're going to be in trouble. Amen. We need to keep the flames burning. We need to keep the flames here at Holmes Bible College burning brightly because we need the fire in these last days. The fire is the only thing that's going to keep the devil out. Right. It's the only thing that will destroy the devil is the fire. Paul was not content with the temperature of the fire, and he gathered sticks to throw upon the mediocre flame in order to increase it. As he was moving away, a snake came out of the fire and latched onto his hand. This was a venomous snake. It was very poisonous, and the people knew that Paul would die because of the bite of this particular snake. Now, there are different kinds of snakes that the church is having to deal with today. Now, I've heard Brother... Uh, uh, brother, I uh, um, can't think of his name now, back in the corner, uh, I've, I've heard him talk about a, a python that he has seen on the property around here. There are different kinds of snakes. One kind of snake is a coisy type snake. Some snakes are coisy and, and can become a pet, and a lot of people use them as pets. In fact, this apparently was a python that someone bought. It's really illegal to buy a python, but they had a python and released it somewhere in the woods back here. And uh, uh, I've heard some of you talk about seeing that python uh, back uh, in, in the woods. But a python is basically a, a cozy type snake, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. And I find it interesting that a snake came out of the fire. This indicates that a snake can be comfortable and cozy in a certain amount of fire. But if the fire is too hot, it's going to come out. It is when the fire is increased that the snake is exposed. The hotter fire stirs the snake and moves it out of its comfortable position. Some snakes can stand more heat than others, but this particular snake couldn't take too much more heat. I'm convinced that there are spirits that have been living just beneath the embers of the mediocre fire for a long time in the church. Some snakes have grown old with the church and have never been exposed because no one has ever added enough fuel to the flame to expose them. That's the condition that most churches are in today. There's not enough fire burning in the church in the Sunday school rooms and in the, uh, in, in the choir and, and in the congregation. There's not enough real hot fire burning to expose them to the congregation and the people so they can deal with those snakes. And I, I'm persuaded today that one of the greatest needs of the church is that we get on our knees and get back talking to God like we used to years ago and get the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in our churches one more time. I want to tell you something. That's the only thing that is going to, going to help the church in these last days is the fire of the Holy Ghost. When there is intensified fasting, prayer, and commitment, you can be assured that spirits unleashed by the enemy will set out to hinder the ministry and the work of the church. 
the hotter the fire, the more the devil's going to try to stop it. He's going to try to put it out. And he'll use all kinds of methods to put out the fire in the church. So, some results there. A lot of results of a snake bite. And I've never really been bitten by a snake. Even the little green snakes that we played with when I was just a young boy. I, uh, you know, they would latch onto our earlobes. But I never really had a bite from one of them. But some results of a, a, a snake bite. If it's uh, the snake bites the hand or the arm, the hand or the arm begins to swell as a hidden snake can suddenly bite you and, and, and actually uh, can cause you to swell and even die. So these spirits that we're talking about can do the same thing to the people in the church. The only thing that can kill the life of the church is the devil and his evil demons and spirits of, that he has placed in the church. The snake put its fangs into Paul's hand. The expected end was that Paul would swell up, fall down, and die. When he didn't, those watching him changed their minds about his ministry and thought, man, this man is a man of God. He's not going to die. The snake bit him. A venomous snake bit him, but he's not going to die. The church, and, and I'm persuaded today that the church has been bit many times, and the common expectation from the world is that we will swell up, fall down, and die, but thank God there are a few churches around that that has not happened to a man. I'm not bragging on my son's church, but uh, uh, when he went to Ball and Springs Church of God in, in Spartanburg, he had nine people. That was about 15 years ago. He's running around 150 today and sometimes more than that. We packed out the church, had to tear down, uh, tear out walls and we bought some property next to us. A church that is on fire, you're going to have to do that with it. you got to make room for people because fire will draw people in. I remember the old-fashioned ice wagons or ice trucks. Some of you uh, remember them like Brother Beatty and Brother, uh, Brother Leggett. They're old enough to remember them. I don't remember them, you know, but they're not. I, I well remember the ice truck that used to come down through the community with the bells ringing telling you that we've got some ice on hand to sell to you. But not too many people would go out to see an ice truck. But you let a fire truck come down the street with a siren blowing and people will come out from everywhere to see what is going on. There's something about fire that will attract people and so it is a church that is on fire for God it will draw people into that church. Amen. Yes. And, and, and we've come to a time when many Pentecostal holiness and church of God and assembly of God and so forth, we used to have the fire burning so much so that people riding by on the streets. Uh, and, and I've heard them stop and say, what in the world is going on? Because we saw flames on the top of the church while y'all were in there praying. It was the fire of the Holy Ghost. And it drew people in. And we had people stop in the highway in Lake City and, and, and call us out to pray for them in the street. I remember that as a young boy. The fire of the Holy Ghost would do something and uh, to people and draw them in to find out what in the world is going on. Paul's hand in this account is symbolical of the fivefold ministry of the church, the ministry of the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the apostle, and the evangelist all have suffered bites of, of the enemy for a long time. Some ministers have, have indeed swollen, they've fallen down and died. However, the church of the living God has learned that snakes are to be shaken off into the very fire that exposed them. And if you don't shake them off into the fire that exposed them, they're going to come back and bite you again. That's right. And they're going to keep on biting until they kill your spiritual life. But I want to tell you something. There's still power in the blood. There is still power in the Holy Ghost. Amen. There is still power to deal with all the snakes the devil has that he can send against the church. Amen? Amen. Now, we don't showcase our serpents. Some churches do. Uh, but we shake them off in the fire. I remember the time, and there's still a few of them, about five or six of them around. Uh, churches that believe in handling snakes. They 
uh, play with them and they uh, wrap them around their necks and so forth and 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 uh, while they're worshiping in their services now we're not talking about church of, church of god's people pentecost all those people and assembly of god we're talking about uh, some of those mountain assembly people up in the mountains of uh, Tennessee and so forth, and there's still a few of them that they they handle serpents. And, uh, you know, I, you're not going to get me to do that. I'm a coward, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm just not going to play with serpents. If I see a serpent, I'm going to kill him if I can. But the same fire that exposes also extinguishes. There is another kind of snake that I want to talk about, and that's the squeezing type of snake. <clears throat> All snakes don't bite. Some simply squeeze the life out of the victim, leaving every bone in place, and they come back later to eat the body of the victim. That's, uh, there are different kinds of snakes that will do that. I'm not as concerned about the bite of a serpent as much as I am the squeeze of the python spirit to, that can wrap itself around the church and contract its muscles and then crawl away leaving our structure intact but our breath, our life, our spirit completely gone. And if the devil can steal your life, if he, if he can steal your spirit, if he can steal the breath of the Holy Ghost in you, then you've got nothing else to offer. The building is not going to draw people in. The Holy Ghost will do it. And it was 15, 16, 70 years ago when the Holy Ghost moved in our churches. And I'm talking about the Pentecostal. We went to the Pentecostal the Church in Lake City and I remember May Putnam weighed about 350 pounds. And when that woman was, she was an evangelist, P.F. Pentecostal Holiness Evangelist. And when that woman walked to the pulpit and started preaching, when she got through preaching, if you didn't come to the altar, she went back and caught you by the ear and drugged you to the altar. And you didn't get up until you prayed through and found God. We need them. I don't know whether that was fire or physical force or what, but it got the job done anyway. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost to bring revival into our churches today. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Like squeezing snakes, there are spirits set against the church that are stifling and smothering us, and it's time to shake them off of the fire. But you got to have a fire to shake them off in. And the sad part about it, not too many churches have any fire left. Uh, I did, when I first retired about uh, 15 years ago, I, uh, I did a lot of evangelistic work, a lot of revivals and, and camp meetings and stuff like that. And some of the churches I went into, and I thought I'd walked into a, a freezer or something. It was so cold, and those churches were supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost. You, we need the Holy Ghost power in our churches today. When you approach spiritual warfare and begin to deal specific, specifically with familiar spirits, you will quickly determine that they appear in Scripture in both the male and the female gender. Now, I want to deal only with the female gender. I'm not picking on you ladies, but I want to deal only with the female gender for the next few minutes. There are three that I want to talk about in the female gender snakes of that the devil has sent into the church. And this is not a picking on the ladies' day, so don't take it that way. There is the Herodias spirit. This is a snake that is in the church and is growing and getting bigger and bigger in the church. It's hiding it in the church so people can't see it, but the Herodias spirit is in the church today. This is that behind the scenes spirit that is continually planning and plotting and allowing others to do the dirty work. This spirit stirs things up and then backs away and hides and let others do all the work. And there's a lot of people like that in the church today. Herodias charted the, the destruction of John the Baptist through the, the seductive dance of a young girl. Every sense in the king was stirred to the point that he offered half of his kingdom to the young girl if she would keep on dancing for him. The main objective of the Herodias spirit 
is to silence the voice of repentance and conviction that leads to revival and get the men, especially the men's minds, centered on lust and being seduced by the devil and his powers. And I want to tell you something, that spirit is in a lot of our pulpits today. It's in a lot of churches, in a lot of our pulpits. We need to shake it off in the fire of Holy Ghost revival. I want to tell you something. All the counseling in the world is not going to solve those kind of problems. That's right. I've done a lot of counseling. I've counseled hundreds and even thousands of people over the years. But I'll tell you right now, counseling will not solve those kind of problems. It will take the fire of the Holy Ghost to do it. The very thing we need the most is the very thing we are not seeking God for. And that's a move of the Holy Ghost power in our lives, in our churches, and even at Holmes Bible College. Brother Leggett, I'll never forget last year when you called for a 24-hour prayer chain in our school, and it brought results. The fire began to burn in every classroom. I, I remember one service I, when we went to my classroom, and we couldn't even have class. I had young men on their knees and bowing, laying on the floor of the classroom and so forth. I didn't do it. This <laughs> chapel service stirred up the devil, and the Herodias spirit had to run and hide so the Holy Ghost could get back to doing his job dealing with people's lives. We need the Holy Ghost spirit to, in our churches today. Herodias danced or charted the destruction of John the Baptist through su the, the seductive spirit of a young girl. The main objective of the Herodias spirit is to silence the voice of repentance and conviction that leads to revival. John had been the voice of one crying in the wilderness. His message had been repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he preached. This spirit is out to remove the head of the church. If the head is removed, the body is useless. If the head of the church is, re is, is removed, there will be no hearing, there will be no speaking, there will be no vision, and without a vision, the people perish. And it's the devil's job through these spirits in the church to squash or hide or get rid of this spirit of revival, this vision spirit to if the pastor as a, uh, of the church, the Sunday school teachers and the leaders of the church are, are removed, then the body is useless and helpless it un to un uncover the snake. The church will die, but then snakes uh, lack dead things. They lack dead things. And so it doesn't bother them for, for the church to die because that's meat for them to eat. They're dead. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot of churches out there that claim to be Pentecostal. We're talking about Church of God, too. They claim to be Pentecostal. They're dead. They're meat for the devil. And they're dead. There's no moving of God's spirit in the church. So the Herodias spirit is one of the snakes that's hidden in the church. Then there's the Jezebel spirit. This is another snake that is hidden in the church. And I want to tell you again, the only way you can deal with the Herodias, the Herodias spirit and the Jezebel spirit is through the fire of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call him, the third person of the Trinity, we need his presence, we need his power, we need his fire burning in our souls and in our churches today. That is the only way we can deal with the devil and deal with these spirits that are coming out of and coming against the church today, the Jezebel spirit, another snake in the church. This is a dominating and controlling spirit. This spirit is out to silence the voice of revival. This spirit will camouflage itself in hides. It's amazing to me that Elijah ran from Jezebel shortly after standing against the prophets of Baal, 850 of them, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves, she is an intimidating power. She wants control of the church. And if she can get control of the church, she can make the church do what she wants them to do. But I want to tell you something. We need, again, we need the fire of the Holy Ghost to, to come down into our midst and uncover these spirits that are hidden in the church. 
In Revelation chapter 2, Jezebel is mentioned again, and I'm not going to take time to read those scriptures, but certainly this is not the, key, the same person since so many years have passed from 1 Kings of chapter 18. However, her spirit had transcended time and is contended with in the New Testament church. Men, and I will tell you, you, you guys something, men can be Jezebels in spirit just like women. You can have the Jezebel spirit just like a woman can have it. You can't always keep Jezebel out of the church, but you don't have to elect her to an office. And a lot of churches are doing that. You can shake her off in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And my Lord, the Holy Ghost fire, it will reveal her and destroy her. The Jezebel spirit. Then the Mikhail spirit. And this is the last one I want to talk about this morning. The Mikhail, not Michael, but Mikhail spirit. M-I-C-H-A-L is spelled. Uh, this is not, not the word Michael, but Mikhail. This is King Saul's daughter. She became David's wife. This spirit is out to silence the voice of praise and worship. She told David, you made a fool of yourself by praising and worshiping and dancing before God. My Lord, how in the world did he make a fool of himself? We need more of that in the church today. We need people dancing in the spirit, shouting in the spirit, running these aisles out here, the, these corridors in this Bible college, running up and down the stairs, worshiping and praising and magnifying God. Now, Brother Legan might stop you from doing it, but I don't think he will. We need it today. We need to feel the Holy Ghost like we felt him 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. Amen. We need the Holy Ghost. You can't always keep Jezebel out of the church, but you can. You don't have to elect her to office. Then there's the Mikhail spirit, not Michael, as we mentioned. This spirit is out to silence the voice of praise and worship in the church. Mikhail was David's wife, but was identified as Saul's daughter. She possessed the same suspicious and critical spirit that her father had as she accused David and found fault with his praise and worship. That spirit is still around. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's hidden somewhere. I'll guarantee you it's hidden somewhere in this chapel. You can't see it. But it don't, if you start praising and worshiping and magnifying God, something's going to happen to try to hinder you and get you to stop doing it. It's the Mikhail spirit that's trying to get you to stop doing those things. This spirit is all around, but the answer, is, again, is the fire of the Holy Ghost. When it reaches a certain degree of heat, these spirits, as well as others, are consumed by the fires of revival. And my Lord, we need the yes. fires of revival today like we have never needed the fires before. Amen. Yes. We need the heat and the flames of a Pentecost. That's the only thing that's going to bring the church back to her knees. And that's the only thing that's going to bring sinners to the cross of Calvary. That's the only thing that's going to apply the blood afresh and anew to our souls and spirits and wake us up and make us realize the day and the hour that we're living in. I'm telling you, saints of God, we need a Holy Ghost revival in the church. My prayer is that we will not be intimidated by the bite or the squeeze of the serpent but we'll continue to add fuel to the fire and allow God to lead us further in revival. We need Holy Ghost fire in our church. Snakes will die in Holy Ghost fire. They will scream while they're dying, but they must die. The church must kill the snakes in it. But the, the sad part about it, a lot of times in a lot of churches, the snake is in the pulpit. He's hidden underneath the top shelf. He's in the pulpits of the church. I want to tell you something. A minister that will stand in the pulpit and preach the word of God, then when he leaves the pulpit and live like the devil during the week on the outside, he is full of the devil. Amen. That's one of the spirits that's hidden in the church. I'm talking about God's Holy Ghost power. We need that more than ever before in the church. We need the move of God. I remember a revival I preached many, many years ago about 
oh, 40, 45 years ago in Tampa, Florida. And, and, and I had read over and over a Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and I'd read of how that while he was preaching, people would scream and fall on their faces and crawl like a snake under the, under the pews till they got to the front of the church, to the altar. They would scream and cry and pray and ask God, beg God to forgive them of their sins and have mercy on them. I told the church, I said, now this is about, about 40 years ago, and I told the church, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I know you work hard, you put in eight, ten, eight to ten hours a day, and then you, you rush home, and sometimes you change your clothes, and sometimes you don't have time, but you come on to the revival, you come on to the church anyway, and I'll make an agreement with you. If you will continue doing that, to, I will spend eight hours a day fasting and praying and laying before God, studying the Word, so that when I walk in the pulpit every night, the Holy Ghost will fill this place, will shake it, and, and sinners will be shaken out of the pews and, and brought to the altar. Let me tell you something. After the first night, it happened. We looked back and we saw, I don't know how many people crawling under the pews trying to get to the altar, and people were finding God, and we had something like 50 or 60 people saved in just a few nights in that revival. Let me tell you something. If it took it back then, it will take the same kind of dedication to sin to have a holy family and holy ghost revival. And I, I, I feel like I know a little bit of the heartbeat of our president. I, I, I've talked with him a lot, a lot and he's lived in my home. And I'll tell you right now, Brother Leggett's a man that wants revival. He wants this student body to really feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He's not interested in you feeling the hidden snakes. And they're around. You can rest assured they're around. But Brother Tyndall, he, he's the one. I think he was playing with that python or something one day not too long ago. But he saw the python out back out here and some of the students have seen it. Too. But Brother brother Leggett is not interested in us playing with snakes. And I, I know he was uh, just teasing about that snake. But there is a real python back there somewhere from what the students have said. But what Brother Leggett wants us to do is he wants us to feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. Because you see, if the fire of the Holy Ghost begins to burn in this chapel and in this school, that python will die. It cannot live in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Sin and the devil and demonic spirits cannot live in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When I was a young evangelist, I... My wife was, was an evangelist also in the state of Florida, and I was from South Carolina. We met at Lee College, and uh, a short time later, we got married, and we would go from one revival to another. Another, I would be closing out on Sunday night while she went ahead and opened up at the next place, and, and we went from one revival to the other, and people were saved by the hundreds. Of, but I want to tell you what we did. We fasted and prayed and stayed in the Word of God. We, we loved God with all of our hearts, and we us, uh, saw his face uh, and God came on the scene and he did things for us and not just for us but did things in those revivals uh, it's going to take the same thing today that it took back then yes. it's going to take the same kind of dedication on the part of young men and women, boys and girls in these days. It's going to take fasting and praying. There is no shortcut to revival. You can study all the Jonathan Edwards sermons you want to study about sinners in the hands of an angry God. You can do all the studying of Joe McKinney's theology and thank God he's a great theology teacher. You can do all the studying about these things and it's wonderful. You need to do it to but what we need more than anything else, we need to see some calluses on the knees of you students. And not only you students, but on the knees of, of the faculty members, we need to see some calluses where we've been on, on our knees seeking God and calling upon God. He's the only one that can bring revival. He's the only one that can bring change. He's the only one that can uncover and destroy the works of the devil in these last days but let me tell you something he will do it if we will pay the price yes whoa hallelujah yes. lord take this message today drive it home to every heart your will be done we pray in jesus name thank you lord
would you stand? And I want you to join hands with the person next to you. Now, I want you to let's pray one for another. That God will take the words of this message and shake us out of our beds at night. Shake us to our knees. Seek ye his face. Hey, that